All right. Thank you so much for joining us. I see more people. We have around 80 people right now, but I know there is at least around 190 people joining us tonight, which is great. Uh, we're going to wait maybe a couple more minutes uh, for people to join. So please, if you just join in, uh, remember to uh, mute yourself. Uh, we're going to go through this presentation and at some point we'll go through the Q&A section. Uh, this is when we'll allow people to speak. Uh, just uh, let's all remain muted until you are able to talk. So thank you so much. Uh, so Patrick is asking a question in the chat that he's not seeing the Q&A option. Uh, so what we're going to do now, um, we're going to um, have the raise hand option. So at any point during this presentation, you're more than welcome to uh, ask a question through the chat. But if you really want to speak at the end, uh, I'll recommend using the raise hand option. Uh, I could let you know when this will be available uh, and then you'll be able to, you'll have around one or two minutes to ask your question. All right, I see we have around 125 people joining. Uh, and I'm really happy to see that the community is joining. Uh, your feedback is really important to us. And hopefully, uh, we'll have great questions from you all. Hello there. Hi, how are you doing? I'm good. This is uh, Ali Al Kafaji and my wife Sumin Cho. She's going to come in a very short time. That's great. That's great. I'm, I'm happy we have you guys. Uh, is that okay if I ask you to mute yourself for now? Uh, will we have a um, moment where everybody? <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. And we're really happy to have you here with us tonight. Um, yeah. Uh, so we. The way this is going to go, we'll be presenting for the first uh, part of the presentation. We'll be presenting the different projects that the city has, and we'll have a Q&A section, which in this case is going to be, uh, you'll, everybody will have at least one to two minutes to talk. Um, please, uh, you'll see a option at the bottom of your screen that says raise hand. Uh, when you click on that, that will like prop you all the way to the top. And that way, when I, I call your name, you'll be able to speak for one to two minutes. So we really hope to hear your questions. Also, uh, feel free to ask any questions through the chat. I already see that we have Dave uh, Sobel asking, out of curiosity, is the Gap tra Trail uh, clear yet? Uh, that's a great question. And hopefully, uh, the city can help us with that. Oh. Somebody's already responding to him in the chat. Thank you, uh, Mary, for that. But yeah, feel free to ask questions in the chat. Uh, I know that we will have a lot of people tonight. We have around 141 people already. It, we're expecting around a little bit less than 200. So we will really try to uh, answer as many questions, questions as we can. But if for some reason we can answer all your questions, we'll always take those and respond to you uh, via email after the meeting. So just you know, remember that if we don't answer your question right away, we'll, we'll answer you at some point. So, all right, I think, let me see what time it is. Oh, so Ariel said that the raise hand option does not seem to be visible at the bottom of the screen. Maybe if people are using different uh, platforms uh, or maybe some versions of Zoom, Maybe it might depend. Uh, maybe if people are using their cell phones or are using a an iPad, I think those things might be the reason. I think for the time being, oh, it's under reactions. That's great. Thank you, Tim, for answering that question. 
Uh, yeah, so I guess we could uh, go ahead and start. I, I see around 150 people and it's 6.05. Uh, I think we can start now. Maybe more people will join. But yeah, just if you just join, uh, we'll go through the presentation and we'll let you uh, ask questions at the end. So yeah, please, if you have questions, use, you know, we'll let you know when this will happen and then you'll be able to use the raise hand option and we'll call your name and we'll, you'll be able to speak for a couple of minutes. But uh, yeah, why don't we go ahead and start? I guess I'll introduce myself. My name is Ricardo Solis. I uh, am working with Healthy Right. We're partnering with the city right now and then I'll be your host and moderator, moderator for the night. So thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you. All right, I see. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I'm just going to say something. I have a quick question from Tim. He's asking if we are recording this tonight. We will be recording this meeting. So if you, for some reason, won't be able to spend the whole night here, uh, you'll be able to find this recording as well. Sorry. Uh, no, that was wonderful. Uh, thank you, Ricardo. Um, welcome all. My name is Angie Martinez. I am the Acting Assistant Director for the Bureau of Policy, Planning, and Permits with the City of Pittsburgh's Department of Mobility and Infrastructure, um, otherwise known as DOMI. Um, I want to take a second to um, thank you all for your interest um, and availability to participate in this um, Zoom outreach. Um, I know this is not the way that, you know, we would um, choose to engage you guys if we had, you know, if we had it our way, we would be in one room together and able to speak with you, um, you know, one on one and in groups and so thank you for your patience as you know we work through this less than ideal situation. Um, just to reiterate some of um, the important sort of um, engagement rules um, through the Zoom meeting platform that Ricardo touched on. Um, if you guys have any issues with like hearing me or connectivity, I've asked Ricardo and Anna um, Tang to monitor the chat and to interrupt if for some reason we have a tech issue that's interfering with you guys understanding um, any part of the presentation. And then also to please use um, that chat function to um, uh, ask any questions or log questions. Are you able to hear me, Ricardo? Uh, yeah, we heard most of it. I think at some point uh, it got muted, but yeah, yeah we, we got most <laughs> yeah. of it. <laughs> So technical, um, that's a demonstration of potential technical difficulties. So yeah, please use that uh, chat function. And um, I think uh, we will leave plenty of time um, for discussion and comments at the end. Um, we'll also make sure that we leave you guys with information for how to continue to engage um, with this program through website, social media, um, et cetera. So again, um, I'm Angie Martinez. Um, I'm joined tonight by my colleague Paige Anderson, who's a staff engineer with our Traffic Bureau. Um, I'll be starting the presentation by giving just an overview of the Move Forward program, which is a relatively new initiative out of DOMI, um, meant to fill the critical gaps in our city's transport and our citywide uh, bicycle network. Um, and then I'll pass it to Paige, who's going to speak in greater detail on um, seven specific projects that we've identified and talk a little bit about some of the um, safety and design considerations that the city is looking at as we're um, really just beginning the planning um, and engineering phase. Um, before we get too far, I wanna emphasize that this is just the first of several meetings that we'll be doing. Um, and that it's really meant to give you an introduction to the Move Forward program and an overview of the seven projects that we're looking at in Shadyside and Squirrel Hill. Um, we hope to leave you with um, a lot of information on how to continue to engage throughout this process. So next slide. Um, Restating this, Move Forward is an initiative of DOMI um, meant to fill in the critical gaps that we identified in our bicycle network through our 2020 Bike Plus Master Plan. Um, I'll touch on that in a little bit greater detail on the next slide. Um, I also want to... I 
keep getting muted. Um, I want to mention here that uh, while Domi is leading um, Move Forward, we are responsible for the planning, the design, the engineering, and ultimately the implementation of any of these projects. We are working with local partners by Pittsburgh and Healthy Ride on um, doing some of the necessary outreach to make sure that we're spreading the word about this program and that residents um, within the city, not just the bicycle um, advocacy or the bicycle community know about um, these potential changes to the roadway and um, bicycle facilities. So I want to thank uh, Bike Pittsburgh and Healthy Ride for doing their part to spread the word. I think the fact that we have 162 people on a Zoom chat um, is really reflective of the fact that the projects that we're talking about are really important and they're in great interest. And we're also doing, I think, a, um, a fair job of making sure that um, the community is engaged at a very early point in the process. Next slide. So this slide is uh, intended to show the 2020 uh, network that was, or excuse me, the bicycle network that we identified in our 2020 Bike Plus Master Plan. Um, this was a several years long effort um, to look at the city's existing um, bicycle network. So everything from our, our trails and um, cycle tracks to on-road um, bike lanes and bike routes. Um, mapping those existing facilities and then identifying the missing pieces between them. Um, so this planning effort was intended to outline clear steps towards creating safe, comfortable, and convenient bike, a, a safe, comfortable, and convenient bicycle network for all types of riders and all types of trips. Um, when we uh, began this process, um, just a couple of, I think, important um, statistics down here at the bottom. 23% um, of Pittsburgher or Pittsburgh households do not have access to a personal automobile. So cycling is a very um, uh, uh, feasible and reasonable transportation option for um, households that don't have vehicles and then also for households or individuals that choose to bike. Um, we also, uh, through this process, um, and I put a link to uh, the Bike Plus Master Plan here so you can delve, it to, delve into it in greater detail if you wish. Um, if you were to expand that map, you would see that some of these gaps in the network, um, you know, the proposed uh, route to fill these gaps is pretty well known. Um, there's, you know, just, uh, limited amount of uh, alternatives for, you know, filling this gap. Um, there are others which we have, I lost my presentation here. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> You're good. Oh, sorry, I was trying to figure it out because people were asking if we could add uh, some sort of uh, subtitles, but I don't see the option to be honest with you. So I apologize for that. Yeah, um, maybe that's something we can put in um, after um, or look at for the next one. Um, I apologize. All this to say that when we did this overall bike network plan, um, some of the gaps um, we feel as though we understand um, and others we defined as these future bike corridors, which have um, sort of a, a known gap in the, the network that we know are going to require a fair amount of planning and research to identify um, the right route and the right type of facility to fill that gap. So just an appreciation that um, these lines on, the on a map are not all equal and that um, there's a certain and differing level of uh, planning, engineering, and engagement that need to go into making any one of these um, missing gaps a reality. Slide. Um, this next slide is meant to uh, just convey our sort of method for the Move Forward Pittsburgh campaign. Um, so because we're working at a citywide level, we're building out a citywide bicycle network. Um, we know that we still need to engage um, on a neighborhood and a community and on a street level. So 
in order to do that in a meaningful way, what we did is we um, took the city and we divided it into what we're calling clusters. Um, and this is not related to council district or ward or any geography like that, but it's really more about these connections, um, but these missing connections and the communities um, that are impacted by them. And so um, that's how we sort of organized um, the outreach um, for this program. Um, after identifying these sort of geographic areas for which to come to you guys to talk about specific projects, um, we went through all of the projects identified in the Bike Plus plan um, to try to get a better sense of sort of readiness. So how, where are those lines on the map in terms of actually being ready for a project? Um, to try to suss out the, again, the right level of planning, engagement, and design needed to make those um, connections a reality. Um, as a part of that process, we also screened um, projects for levels of engagement um, based on planning, planning and engineering feasibility. Uh, Paige, I think, is going to elaborate that on that a bit more um, in her portion of the conversation. Um, we have had some initial outreach um, you guys may be aware of. Obviously, you heard about Move Forward um, through something. So we've been talking about this program, really trying to make it visible and public. We've also had conversations with um, the council district, um, neighborhood planners, community stakeholders to make sure that we're preparing things in the right sort of way to engage the community. Um, and again, we're here today for our cluster click off, which kick off, which means we're at the very beginning um, in our mind of engagement in an earnest way. So the first opportunity um, of hope, hopefully many for you to learn and have feedback on these projects. Next slide. I'm gonna pass the next two slides over to Paige to talk a little bit more about the types of facilities that we're talking about under this program. Hey everybody. Um, I, this first slide is just showing you guys uh, a few of the examples of uh, designed and uh, recently installed infrastructure to kind of help you uh, to help illustrate the spectrum of facilities that we could be talking about today. Um, and I'll go into these more detail, but uh, these first top two examples are neighborways. This one, these are both pictures of the South Side neighborway, which is a shared street condition um, where you use traffic calming to make it safer to share the street on um, streets that, are, that have low volumes um, already. And then uh, Negley Run uh, Boulevard bike lane upgrades. Um, those have been in design and are going to be installed in the spring. Um, so that's a cycle track, um, a more robust uh, bike facility. And then uh, the final example on the lower left is uh, our recently installed gap to the point um, bike connection downtown, which includes not only a cycle track, a bi-directional cycle track, but um, some more robust facilities uh, like this, uh, concrete bus island um, that it creates a safer shared condition between um, people boarding the bus and cyclists downtown. So if you haven't gotten the chance to see that, which maybe you haven't because you haven't been downtown since last year, I hope you get a chance to look at it. Um, most of these move forward projects, however, will be more similar to the other three projects in that um, this program is a, a quick build program. So it's kind of establishing new facilities, improving existing facilities, um, to make things more safe. Uh, well, next slide, please. So all of these various kinds of bike facilities um, sort of fit along the spectrum of um, higher stress bike facilities versus lower stress bike facilities. Um, as a cyclist, the highest stress facility will be um, you know, sharing a normal travel lane with motorists. But when you start talking about bike facilities, there's um, you know, there's buffered bike lanes or typical bike lanes that you'll see, but what we're really trying to, uh, our gold standard that we're really going after are um, bike facilities with the comfort level of all ages and abilities. So some good examples of that are um, neighborways, which are again, shared condition streets, but on um, streets that are usually calmer and um, designed to, to be calm. So they're a better shared condition and are safe for everybody and then protected bicycle lanes and multi-use paths. So um, those are really what we're going for with these facilities uh, whenever possible is, is the standard of all ages and abilities. I'll let Angie take it back. Thank you, 
Yeah, and then just to expand a little bit more on that all ages and abilities concept, um, this is, uh, you know, these types of treatments that we're talking about, um, traffic calming, signage, um, clear sort of rules of the road and a place, um, a place for everybody on the road really increases safety for all modes of travel. So um, slower vehicles um, are less likely to crash. And when they do crash, they're less likely to have severe, um, severe physical um, impact or harm to people. So um, by utilizing these types of strategies, we're creating safer places for people to bike, um, but we're also creating safer streets for people to drive and people to walk as well. Um, all ages and all abilities, these types of facilities, they're also more welcoming to a greater diversity of cyclists. So, um, you know, these facilities that offer um, buffers between um, fast moving vehicles also make it a little bit more uh, feasible for people to bike with things like children or their groceries or bike to work in their uh, working clothes and not their endurance or, um, you know, sportswear. And so that's really what we're trying to get at with the, looking at these types of facilities. They're facilities that work for everybody and not just a sports cyclist. And by doing that, we can make our road safer for everybody too. Um, part of all ages and abilities and uh, making sort of sense of the road here is also that we're increasing um, safety for cyclists by giving them a safe place to cycle. So when we see behaviors like um, cyclists biking on the sidewalk or maybe biking against traffic, that behavior is happening because there's not a safe route provided for them. So by doing the, these types of programs and by installing these types of facilities, we're creating, um, again, that comprehensive network that helps um, cyclists, but also can uh, benefit um, all road reusers and can also attract um, new cyclists to this being um, a feasible and reasonable mode of travel. Next. Um, so one of the last things I'll say about this overarching program is just on the engagement front. So again, because this is a citywide program, we're working uh, throughout the city and many neighborhoods, um, a lot of projects. And so um, in order to do, uh, to be in service of the communities that we're working in, um, we utilized the Department of City Planning's engagement guide to make sure that we're um, involving the community at the right time and to the right extent. So um, this slide is just to say that we are coming to you with the expectation that we are consulting and involving you in our process. We are not here with designs today um, for things that are ready to be constructed tomorrow. We are at the point in the process that we are um, soliciting response and feedback on the projects that we are talking about on these streets. Next. And to that- Further, so they're like... <laughs> Yes, and then to that point, um, these are some of the upcoming meetings that will be coming up. Um, and I will now pass it over to Paige to talk in a little bit more detail about our projects. Hi everyone, uh, we can go to the next slide. So uh, again, my name is Paige Anderson. I'm a project engineer in the traffic division. Um, I just want to reiterate that all of these projects are still firmly in the planning phase. So um, I'm just going to go through a lot of the data that we collect and um, have started to look at um, that will inform the decisions that we're making in the design phase um, and give you guys an idea of, of where we're starting. Um, so I'm going to start with Shady Side. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the first project that I'm discussing is the Aiken Ave and Liberty Ave extension, um, which you'll see called out as number one. The green um, facilities north of it are Liberty, the existing facilities on uh, Liberty Ave, and it connects in, into Shady Side. Next slide.
So uh, again, it connects those existing facilities that you'll see. This is a video of this is right at uh, this intersection with Sender, but it will connect all the way from Baum to Ellsworth. Next slide, please. Uh, so the existing conditions on Aiken. Um, this is an example of like all the data that we collect around each project before we even have entered the design phase. Um, so this segment is just over a quarter mile long with three lanes, which means it's very wide, um, 40 feet on that main part. And then that last little connection by Morrow Park is 50 feet wide. Um, there's sidewalks on both sides and um, AADT is av average annual daily traffic. Um, which is quite high on the street. It hovers over 11,000. Um, and I believe this is all pre-COVID more standard numbers uh, than what you would see today. But this boasted speed limit is 25 miles per hour. Um, there's no parking already on the facilities as it is today. And um, this project is actually on the capital budget, um, which is pretty exciting. Uh, I think uh, perhaps for the reasons that there's been a lot of attention on Aiken Ave is this crash data. So when we get reported crash data is uh, we look at a five year period typically. And um, again, this is just reported. So pet, uh, pedestrian and cyclist uh, crashes are, are very much underreported and this is all total crashes. Um, but this for such a small corridor, this is a lot of crashes. So nearly 60, um, 12 involving pedestrians and one involving a cyclist. Um, and again, that's just what's been reported to uh, the police. Um, next slide, please. So uh, this will connect commuters and recreational cyclists who use the existing facilities on Liberty Ave um, with, with Shady Side. Um, and uh, it connects to Ellsworth, which is actually the second most biked route in the city, despite not having bike facilities, which we can talk about a little bit later, but it's uh, clearly a highly used um, connection that connects a lot of grocery stores, multiple neighborhoods and business districts. Um, there's no transit or parking on the corridor today. Next slide, please. The next slide I'm talking about, or the next project, I'm sorry, is um, Melwood Connector. So you'll see it called out over there as number seven. Um, those facilities to the north of it are our neighbor way um, on Gold Way that we installed uh, last year with some speed humps and signage that, um, I, that you will see over there today. Um, and it's gonna connect to those green, the green facility under uh, south of it is Baird. So I'll get into those connections a little bit more in the next slide. Uh, it's under a quarter mile long um, and is uh, travel with bi-directional traffic for um, about half of the part we're looking at and uh, one direction uh, traffic for other parts of it um, with varying widths of just over 30 feet and parking on both sides. Um, pretty low average annual daily traffic and um, but heavily used parking. Uh, there hasn't been a ton of crashes on this street. Um, it has very low volumes. Um, and we, or I guess we'll go to the next slide. Sorry, I jumped again. This is the street as you see it today. Next slide, please. Um, so again, it connects to a lot of existing facilities um, including the Upper Hill, Polish Hill, and North Oakland. Um, we do not know what the facility will look like yet, but this will be an engagement level of consult. So the, the immediate um, neighbors will be consulted on the design as, as it's pursued. Next slide, please. The next project that I'm gonna be discussing is the Shady Side Connector. Um, you'll see that there are very few bike facilities in Shadyside today as is. There are some Sharrows on um, Negley, 
but there's a lot of facilities around Oakland and Bloomfield, um, but very, very few within Shadyside itself. Uh, next slide, please. So this is Ellsworth, which is um, kind of what we're looking at primarily, but we have yet to decide if the route will be on Ellsworth or will be other, another route that makes a similar connection within the Shadyside neighborhood. Um, but we're looking at connecting um, Neville and Negley primarily in this addition to um, East Liberty. Next slide, please. Uh, I would like to that uh, just around remind people that just joined that uh, that's going to have its own meeting as well, right? Correct. Um, so I'll, we're looking at the existing conditions on Ellsworth. Um, which again, we've learned is the uh, second most biked route in the city, despite having no facilities. Um, the number one biked route in the city is the cycle track on Penn downtown with dedicated facilities. Um, so this is over a mile long um, and has varying widths from 30 feet to 36 feet. Um, sidewalks on both sides and shared lane sharrows along the corridor. Um, the average annual daily traffic changes throughout the corridor. So you'll see at the low end, it's just under 6,000. Um, and then on the busiest parts, it's nearly 9,000 uh, vehicles. The posted speed limit is 25 miles per hour. And in five years, there were 63 crashes uh, reported. Eight of them involved pedestrians and five of them involved bikes. Um, so certainly a concern. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we have not yet proposed a facility um, for Ellsworth or throughout an uh, alternative through Shadyside, um, and, but this is an engagement level of involve. Uh, so that means according to the city planning um, guidelines, we've created an advisory team and a working group that we are working, going to be working with uh, alongside in this design. Uh, there's a lot of connections offered in the bike network, um, including you know, proposed facilities on Aiken, existing facilities on Neville and Negley and all of the you know, universities and business districts uh, throughout Shadyside. Um, there is transit along Ellsworth. And uh, right now we're looking at, um, if we're talking about the current level of comfort on Ellsworth, um, it has some fairly high uh, traffic volumes and um, at least four major, in, uh, major signalized intersections. Next slide, please. I don't know if it's being a little glitchy for all of you, but uh, I'll try to go slow so that we can all stay together um, as we go into the projects that we are looking at through Move Forward um, in Squirrel Hill. If you go to the next slide, I'll. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, in my even though I click right away, it might take a little bit for you to see it. <laughs> yeah, it's totally fine. I think my internet is being wacky too. Um, the first few projects we're gonna be looking at are Beacon Street, um, and there's two segments to this. Uh, the existing facilities um, that you'll see labels number three and proposed facilities uh, on the, late, the part labeled two. Next slide, please. So these, uh, the first section I'll be talking about is the um, part of Beacon from Shady to Whiteman that doesn't currently have any bike facilities. Um, and this is, this is what it looks like today. It's about half a mile long uh, and very, very wide, uh, 50 feet. It has sidewalks on both sides and no bike facilities. Um, the average annual daily traffic hovers between 5,000 and 8,000 with 25 mile per hour speed limits. Um, and parking on both sides with uh, varying demand. Um, in the five years, we've seen 32 crashes, nine of them involving pedestrians. Next slide, please. So we've yet to move into design or propose facilities uh, along this corridor. Um, however, we'd like them to be fairly consistent with uh, the facilities along other part, the other part of Beacon, which I'll get into next. 
Um, but as we pursue design, it, the community will be involved with an advisory group um, per the engagement guidelines that we're following. Uh, the, the bike network um, that it connects to are the existing bike facilities on Beacon and Whiteman, and it will um, lead people towards Beechwood and the, the facilities that already are there. Um, it also connects to a lot of grocery stores, faith-based institutions, parks, um, and there's transit that runs along the corridor, the number 65 and the 93 uh, intersect or run on Beacon. Um, we do not know the level of comfort that we will be attempting to achieve with this design. It'll depend on all of the implications that we are going to be working, working around. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the other part of Beacon is the existing facilities. We are hoping to make some upgrades um, to them to make them to make them better. Um, and those run from Whiteman into Shenley Park. Next slide, please. So this is another uh, about a uh, half a mile long. It's quite wide. Um, it gets a little narrow in the park, uh, but there's parking along the corridor and the parking does, uh, does not exist in the park today um, along, along Beacon. Um, it's got sidewalks and then it turns into, but the, which end at the park and then there's a walkway. Um, the average annual daily traffic is nearly 7,000 with speed limits of 25 um, with fairly high demand for parking. Um, and there have been uh, quite a few crashes for this corridor, uh, given the low AD, the low, um, well, medium volumes. Um, one of them involved a pedestrian and two involved cyclists. Next slide, please. Uh, so it's going to connect the existing facilities, um, Beacon and Whiteman and to Shenley Park um, and another facility that I'll be talking about next. Um, currently it is, you know, fairly comfortable for cyclists along the, where there's, there are bike lanes, the, the issues come when the bike lanes disappear, but, um, we also hope that we can make these bike lanes more comfortable, um, be, uh, than they are today. Next slide, please. Um, the next project is going to connect to those vegan bike lanes, and that is uh, the Shen what we're calling the Shenley Meadow Trail. Um, and it already exists today. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so in Shenley Park, there's currently a trail running through the meadow um, along Hobart and um, Beacon. And uh, it is walkable but it is not accessible to bikes. So we, it's about less than a quarter mile long um, and we're going to try to make it accessible to bikes through the Move Forward program. Um, and it will connect um, you know, into the park and connect those bike facilities. Um, the section, parts of the street next to it that where the bike lanes end and then use you know, a shared condition have had quite a few crashes, including, to, uh, including with cyclists. Um, and we're paying special attention to the Beacon and Hobart intersection. Next slide, please. Um, now I'm going to be talking about Whiteman Street. Uh, similarly, this is an upgrade project. Next slide. So this is a picture of uh, the bike lanes that exist there today from Forbes to Beacon. Next slide, please. It's a, over a quarter mile long and it's very wide, 65 feet wide um, with 12 foot sidewalk. I think that's right. Um, wide sidewalks on, on Whiteman um, and six foot bike lanes. It has over nearly 9,000 um, average annual daily traffic and quite a bit of truck traffic and speeds posted at 25 miles per hour. Um, and parking along both sides. Next slide, please. So 
So we're looking at upgrading the bike lanes um, and we'll be engaging with the community. Uh, sorry, we're consulting with the community for the engagement guidelines um, to do so. It will connect, be, the, it's the connection that already exists today connects um, Forbes, the existing facilities on Forbes to the proposed facilities on Beacon and the existing facilities on Beacon too. Um, and the, and it also makes those, facilitates those connections to the park. Um, again, there's pretty high uh, average annual daily traffic. Next slide, please. All right, thank you so much for that. Uh, so we're gonna allow people to ask questions. I have seen some questions in the chat already, but if you wanna speak, uh, this is your chance. <laughs> Uh, so the way we're going to do this is if you if everybody is able to see the raise hand option, I'll advise you to uh, click on that right now. That will bring your name up to the top. Once you do that, once I see your name with the raise hand, uh, you'll be able to ask a question. I already see people doing that. So thank you for that. If you are having trouble, uh, send me a message and I'll try to see if I can help you find the option. But uh, I would like to ask everybody else to stay muted. Uh, out of uh, respect to the person that's speaking at the moment. And I see we have our first question. We have uh, Su Min Cho. Uh, please unmute yourself. Hello there. Uh, Su Min is my wife. She's sitting beside me, so she, but she agrees with whatever I ask. So um, good. So in regards to Ellsworth, uh, uh, what are the options that you can see um, viable? Like, other than Ellsworth, is there any other uh, alternatives to that uh, that uh, uh, route other than Pembroke? Thank you for that question. So I can take, or oh, Angie, you have it? I, uh, I was just going to offer that um, the connection there or the gap is the east-west um, connection that needs to be made and that we have talked about potential alternatives. Um, and Paige, if you want to talk about what some of those might look like. Yeah, I don't have the, um, the map in front of me right now, but I know that we've been looking at uh, with the advisory group and the committees um, not only Allsworth, but a few different routes through the Shadyside neighborhood. Um, Pembroke, if specifically I know, is is on one of one of them or both of them. Um, but those facilities are a little, would look very different than, you know. There's a lot of options there, and we haven't even narrowed down to to the route. So I can't um, really speak to you know exactly what those alternatives are because there's uh, you know a, quite a few. Yeah, and I would say that the city recognizes that, you know, there was um, the Ellsworth project um, several years ago and that, you know, there's been a clear and consistent desire to ensure that we're looking at um, all alternatives to meet that or fill that east-west um, gap in the network. And um, I think that we, we are approaching that process from a place of wanting an open mind and wanting to explore those options. As uh, Paige alluded to, we do have a um, stakeholder group formed around that. And then we will be having um, separate meetings on that specific project because we recognize the level of interest um, in it from a um, variety of stakeholders. If, if you don't mind, just so me to add, because we had a meeting about Pembroke and that was really a terrible idea. So we will be very much objecting to be Pembroke to be even on the list. Uh, but I was just, I just wanted to make sure that it's dead, not still alive. I would say our process is about um, looking at alternatives and, um, you know, bringing all of those alternatives and trade-offs to, uh, to uh, the community to, to weigh. Um, Thank you very much. All right, thank you for that. Uh, we have next uh, Kate St. John. Please unmute yourself. Hi, um, my question has to do with the Shenley Meadow Trail. Right now that is part of the park and that whole re uh, area was planned to absorb water so it wouldn't cause flooding. So um, 
my concern is that the trail that you are proposing be um, a permeable surface and that it's clearly open to pedestrians as well as bikes because pedestrians use it a lot. Thank you, Kate. Um, I, this project is, that one again, hasn't been moved to design, but I'll certainly try to pass that along. And I will say in initial concepts with, we're working with the Department of Public Works and Parks, um, and we have discussed pervious payment for exactly that reason. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thanks for that. Uh, next time we have Rick, uh, Rick Sinsa, please unmute yourself. Hi there. Um, I'm Tanya, I'm Rich's wife. Um, I don't know if you can see us or not, but that's okay. Um, so on the Beacon Street, the protected bike lanes means you're putting the bike lanes next to the sidewalks and the parking outside from that. How, how does that work between driveways? I mean, how many parking spots are we gonna lose because we need to have space to be able to get in and out from our driveways to get onto the street? I can take this Thank one. Um, again, we haven't moved into the design phase yet. Um, so we're still going, you know, that that's something that'll all be figured out then. But um, it, so I cannot, I cannot speak to that. I know parking protected bike lanes are being considered, um, but I do not know if they've been determined that they're feasible yet, or if that we're moving forward with that design in particular. And if we did um, the implications of it, because it has not moved into engineering at all, but it will be, you know, per the engagement process. Um, I think that one's a, and involve or consult, but it was, people will certainly be consulted. And how long will that project take to actually complete? Again, that's all um, up in the air because it hasn't even moved into the design and engineering phase. Uh, so there's no schedule, um, a time like construction schedule uh, associated with it yet. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, next one, we have Daniel Liger. Please unmute yourself. Hi. Um, yeah, I, I live in the block between Murray and Whiteman on Beacon Street. I'm directly next door to Hillel Academy. And it's a very, very complex block um, with an apartment building for seniors, um, a school, public parking, uh, Munhall Road that goes up to Imperial House. So my concern is I'm really glad this is happening. <laughs> Uh, it, it's long overdue. There were three lanes made a number of years ago that were a disastrous plan. Uh, so I'm glad that this is being looked at. My question is, um, is there really a, going to be an effort to make a comprehensive look at safety and parking for, the, for this block rather than just looking at bike lanes? Thank you for that. Um, yes, I would say absolutely, uh, Daniel, thank you for, um, I hope that you'll be involved, you know, with the, the continuing process around that design. Um, yeah, there's, yeah. I believe that all of those, um, when we put, use the DCP engagement guidelines, um, all of those things are factors that help us decide how, what level of engagement, and that is why it was decided that we needed to work um, closely with the community, because we saw that it is a high use corridor with a lot of different different needs that need to be um, weighed. So I, I hope that you'll contribute, you know, all of those that as inputs throughout that process. Thank you. All right, uh, I see we have more raised, more hands, <laughs> hands being raised. Uh, thank you for that. I'm just gonna do a quick uh, question from the chat. Uh, Thomas is wondering if there's any plans to connect Shenley Meadow Trail to Serpentine, either a repair, reopen, or permanently close to cars. Angie and I are looking at each other. I know that um, DPW has been thinking about Serpentine. Um, I know it's still closed. I wish I had an update uh, for you all. Um, I'm sorry that I don't, but I know that um, Cassandra Leopold, who's our principal planner with the Move Forward program and would be here tonight if she could, but um, she's unable to today. I do know that, that is some, she's been talking with the community about some of these issues and, and it is on her uh, radar. Sounds good, thank you. Uh, we have uh, Chris, Chris DeLucio. Hi, um, 
I'm wondering if you can talk about how dangerous um, the Ellsworth corridor is relative to other places in the city. That's a great question. Thanks for that. Yeah, do we think um, we could go, we could go back to the Ellsworth slide with all the crash data on it, which again is all um, reported crash data is public through PennDOT. Um, I believe that, you know, Ellsworth, the primary reason that it's come to our attention is because it does have such a high volume of cyclists. Um, so there's a lot of conflicts that come with such a high multi-use um, corridor. I don't know if Angie or Anna has anything else to say. I know if they both, uh, we've all been involved in the, the shady side of the stakeholder meetings um, where we're trying to t discuss all of these nuances. Um, yeah. Am I on the right slide? <laughs> Sorry, we don't have to jump back to it if it's a little glitchy. Um, I, let me see. The, the thrust of my question was getting to my sense is that it is a dangerous place for people who are on bicycles. And I was hoping you could quantify, in fact, how dangerous that is um, for people on Ellsworth. I don't think that we have a uh, sort of, if what you're asking is, Ellsworth a more dangerous um, street for cyclists as opposed to comparable, compared to comparable streets. Um, I don't know that I can say that definitively, but it uh, that would be a sort of interesting exercise, I think, to go through. There, there is a prevalence of crashes on this uh, street and, you know, five, five pedestrian, or excuse me, eight pedestrian and five bike um, even looking at the crash data presented for these other segments, um, this is some of the highest we're seeing, understanding that we're also talking about a larger corridor here. So um, I think it, there's probably a way to uh, quantify that in a way that we can more easily compare it to um, other streets. And if that would be um, helpful or illustrative to um, the future discussions we have around Ellsworth. I think that's something we um, we should be able to do. We'll, we'll consider um, trying to draw that parallel. All right, so next one we have Jason. Hi, uh, so my question is regarding the Negley Run upgrade to the to the bike lanes right now. It appeared that the proposal was that it's a, a two lane uh, bike lane, protected bike lane on one side of the road. Is that correct? Yes, that is the design that's going to be installed this spring. Okay. My concern is that um, those that are traveling down the hill, so toward Washington Boulevard, are going to want to stay uh, on the side of the road with with the with the traffic that's flowing in the same direction um, for a couple of reasons. One, um, just speed wise, you can go go faster down the hill um, and avoiding any kind of interactions with cyclists going up the hill. Two would be any kind of interactions that you might have with a motorist that's coming up the hill if they were in fact in the protected bike lane. That's the two way bike lane because um, I know for a fact that motorists are speeding on that on that road. So if you have any kind of crash with the cycles coming down the hill toward toward a motorist coming up the hill, that would be catastrophic. Um, so I was wondering if there's any, uh, you said that that's gonna be built out, but I, I wonder if there's any kind of uh, possibility of having protected bike lanes, single lanes going up the hill, but also going downhill. Yeah, I'm going to try to keep this um, brief. Thank you for the input, just because this has already gone through the design phase and is going to be installed. Um, I was loosely involved in the project. I did not design it. Um, but I will say that we did consider both of those options. Um, there was many constructability and cost constraints that um, chose us to choose the two-way bi-directional cycle track. Um, I know one of them was it is a, a more, it was easier for us to make it an all ages and abilities facility with that. And we were hoping to strive for that because it connects to the trail at the bottom, um, which is of course all ages and abilities because of the trail. Um, so that is ultimately the project we went to, but I do know that we did absolutely consider that. I believe there was some accommodations to design to try to make that downhill facility a little bit um, more comfortable. Uh, I'll also say that again, um, there is a cycle track that I hope people 
feel comfortable on and want to use. But of course, cyclists are always allowed to use the, the travel lane if they do want to really fly down um, Negley Run. They can still do that in the in the travel lane. So um, I hope that you like the facility. And if you have some feedback and you know think it can be improved once it's installed, I hope that you'll uh, give us that via the uh, 311. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. So next we have Robert. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I have a question uh, regarding the um, proposal for Ellsworth Avenue. Um, your the information that you disseminated uh, via the the web uh, indicated that the uh, it was still to be determined one where it was going to be, but it, it also appeared that it also had not been determined what type of infrastructure was going to be placed on Ellsworth. Can you tell me what is what is being considered? Uh, sure, there's a wide range of options that are being considered on Ellsworth and off Ellsworth. Um, the off Ellsworth routes uh, would be more of a neighbor way situation where it's, uh, you know, using traffic calming to help create a safer shared condition whenever possible. And then um, on Ellsworth, you know, there's a, there's a multitude of things that, that we would be considering on Ellsworth. I think there was like three or four, you know, varying degrees that we've been talking, uh, various approaches to design with various implications that we've been talking through with the stakeholder committee. Um, well, but I guess the- Can you share the, with me what those three options are? I don't believe I can right now. I think we've, we've worked with the Shady Side Committee and I haven't been kept up to date on where it's at right now. I know there's some people, I've been watching the chat and I know there's some people that are involved with it that have talked about it a little bit, um, but I don't want to jump ahead into some of those details when I know there's gonna have its own meeting um, later and I don't know where it is sitting okay. today. Two more questions for you. you so you, there's a stakeholders committee or advisory committee. Who is on that committee? Pretty big group. Um, I don't know if Ricardo or Anna might be able to help me out here, um, but I know that there's it's a pretty extensive um, group that we worked with the council people and uh, the local community groups to to determine a representation. Yeah, I can jump in here. Um, the list of groups that are involved are listed on the project's uh, website, and as soon as I find it, I'm going to post it in the chat. Great, thank you. And one last question, if I could. Um, you, you had indicated that Ellsworth um, was the second most uh, used corridor for bikes in the city. Is there a traffic study that shows that? Yeah, I wish I knew exactly what it was. There was a pretty big um, effort done with in conjunction with Bike Pittsburgh and planning um, a few years ago, or. That, that helped us uh, reach that conclusion. Um, I'm sorry, yeah. I don't know it off the top of my head if anyone else does. We can look for it. There was a coordinated effort to um, collect uh, bicycle counts along uh, design, you know, designated bike routes and bicycle facilities, and then also corridors that we knew were just um, high in bicycle activity. And that's where that ranking came from. Uh, okay, okay, so I, I guess I'm, I'm still, I'm, a little confused. Um, so there is or is not a, a, a traffic study with respect to that? There are traffic counts, which is different than a, a study. So okay, so there, there were- there, They there are were, supported by, by the data being collected. And, and who's collecting that? Uh, the city collected those counts. Okay, so, so, so you have those somewhere we could see those? Mm -hmm. And as a part of some of the, uh, as we have, I think, taken care to try to convey, we are at, you know, an early stage in the process now. Um, we do have um, consultants that um, we have contracts with to do further study on certain corridors and projects as needed. Um, and that could include the possibility of going out and collecting um, more current counts. Um, I can't say if, you know, this is going to be a location where we would go um, collect those counts, but um, it is certainly a possibility that we would have updated um, vehicle and bike counts, ped counts, 
uh, even transit, you know, the number of transit vehicles um, as, you know, collected as part of making um, a design determination. So um, that's a, that is an option that is available to us um, as we move along in the, the process. Okay, thank you. Well, Appreciate it. Also, also, Bike Pittsburgh and SPC, Southwest Planning Commission, do bike counts about twice a year with volunteers. And so they have a number of intersections, I think around 20 or 30 intersections that they have volunteers sitting at counting bicycles, both during commute time and non-commute time. And they do this twice a year. So if you'd like to volunteer to help collect that, contact one of those groups, they'll be happy to take you, show you how to do it and, and help you with it. Thank you. Thank you for that. All right, we have uh, Deborah next. Hi, um, I have a couple of questions. Number one, um, in regard to Ellsworth, um, have you looked at eliminating the bus traffic on Ellsworth, which I think would um, clearly help the cyclists as well as uh, vehicular traffic on that? Has that been considered? Thank you for the question. Um, oh, okay. I have one more too. Um, <laughs> In terms of traffic calming methods, um, which is a great term, I'd love to know what are considered best in class uh, methods. So as we look at speed bumps or other things that would help slow um, the um, traffic along there as people use it as a commuter um, instead of center or fifth, what might be other options to look at since most of us are not um, transit experts. So those are my two questions. Thank you, Libra. I guess I'll start. Um, the first question was about uh, the buses. Um, I do believe that we've looked in looking with the stakeholder group, we have been working with the Port Authority too to, to figure out how different designs could work with transit. Um, I would say typically transit and bikes are not the big, the major conflict. Um, you know, there's professional drivers there and oftentimes we'll find that that's safer conditions to share, share the road between buses and bikes. So I don't think that we would consider just removing transit and removing all of those facilities for a very highly used transit route, um, you know, in the name of bike safety. But I do know that there's some options in this complicated design that again, I don't um, feel comfortable getting into all the options that could possibly be considered um, but some of them I do know had some implications to transit, possibly. Um, so of course the Port Authority, you know, is, is very involved in that. And I think we'd hope to impact transit as little as possible, um, you know, if, 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 and to weigh all, all those user groups um, in any decision that we make. Um, the other question was on traffic calming. Um, and I hope that I, I can't remember every all the details of your question, um, so you can interrupt me if I am not answering. Yeah, it. I just wanted to know what what are the traffic calming best in class methods that other cities and communities use to slow down or manage the traffic um, in in congested areas where you want to have bike traffic as well. Sure. Um, so traffic calming is a pretty complicated, evolving. Uh, way of traffic engineering um, a t a thing that's, you know, all cities are doing in many different ways. And we've seen different, a lot of different, um, different options um, that work for different contexts. Uh, so some, but I'll, I guess I can maybe talk about three examples that you'll see a lot in our city um, that are examples of traffic calming. And that's uh, the first major one is speed humps. Um, speed humps work when the speeds are really high and we want to bring them down to something more reasonable. They aren't as good for um, super high volume roads and roads where you're taking the roads, the speeds are already kind of in the middle and getting them down really low. They're not always the best option for that. Um, another odd thing that we're looking at is traffic circles. We started using neighborhood traffic circles. Again, these are like mini, mini traffic circles in residential neighborhoods that um, go in areas that are typically a four way stop and work to make traffic move uh, slower through the entire corridor. Um, and then another thing that you may see at the traffic calming um, tool that we use in the city are um, bump outs, which uh, work to take, especially usually it's 20 feet, but any kind of area where as you approach an intersection, 
um, any kind of encroachments to sight lines. Um, they work to keep those. Uh, they work to keep those sight lines clear to make a safer shared condition. So traffic calming is a lot of nuances. Um, I know a great resource that I can I would recommend looking at if you are interested in learning more about traffic calming in all sorts of cities is um, NACTO, National Association of City Transportation Officials, has a really great website where they talk about um, sort of the latest and greatest and the research around what different cities are doing to try and calm traffic. All right, thank you for that. Next, we have uh, Richard. Uh, yes, hi, back up in Squirrel Hill. Um, <laughs> Uh, you've done a good job at uh, local street connections and, and the bicycle facilities can, that can go therein. Uh, but you could use more of a, or add on a regional consideration and that is how to get Squirrel Hill people down to the regional trail system. I'm talking about Junction Hollow and Hazelwood and um, uh, the Eliza Furnace Trail. And uh, you do have uh, Greenfield Avenue, but that's not very good for your average bicyclist. Um, and uh, over the years, the Squirrel Hill Urban Coalition has proposed a couple of different approaches. One is to use the trail system within Shenley Park to get down to the Junction Hollow, but you may need that underpass of the railroad tracks to make that work. And in addition, the coalition has proposed a new trail uh, called the Run Forward uh, facility, which would um, begin at the Lifetime Automotive uh, down a lower Forward Avenue and run parallel to the Parkway East and connect with uh, Celine Street in the run. So uh, bottom line is I'd like to see original consideration added to this, to this effort. Thank you for that, Richard. Angie, do you think you might be able to take that one? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I wasn't sure if we were expecting a, a response on that, but I think um, it's important to uh, sort of distinguish here that the move forward projects that we're talking about are um, things that are a little bit uh, more rapid implementation. Um, so things that will probably be able to be designed and um, if installed, installed in a nearer term. Um, there's definitely um, no shortage of um, larger regional or maybe heavy, more heavy infrastructure lifts that are needed to complete these connection, other connections. Um, I think those things were captured in the Bike Plus Master Plan um, in our, you know, efforts that are going to require, um, you know, a, additional study and probably greater engineering than what we would be talking about under the scope of this project um, or this program, I should say. Um, but Thank you for bringing it up. And I, I do think, you know, there's certainly a place for it in our planning efforts. Um, it's just not a move forward type of project. For the constraints that you, you pointed out, the topography, um, the infrastructure, the... Um, yeah. All right, thank you for that. Um, before going along with the next people that raise their hands. I just want to remind everybody that this meeting is being recorded uh, and you'll be able to find it on the website. I'll also send it to you via email to the email that you use to register for this meeting. Um, also really quick, I want to tell that we have a lot of questions in the chat as well. And I don't want you to feel like we're going to, I'm not going to answer those. Uh, we're going to send, if we can answer any of those right now, we'll also create like an FAQ and we'll add those questions there as well. I just going to before keep moving to the next people uh, that raise their hand and just going to um, read these questions on the chat. Are there any plans for pedestrian or bike improvements within the Squirrel Hill Business District, specifically on Forbes and Murray? Um, there's none that we are considering with the move forward projects right now. Uh, I can't, those are only the ones that I've, you know, there's Murray, the ones that, um, sorry, Beacon goes through Murray. Um, so there's ones that touch it. Um, but as I've gone through all the projects uh, that we are considering for a part of this move forward effort of 2021. So um, they do touch some of the business districts, um, but I do not believe there's any that are on Forbes or Murray directly. 
Thank you for that. Uh, next one, we have Elisa. Elisa, please uh, unmute yourself. Hi, I just wanted to bring up a couple of points. Um, so I saw the list of all the stakeholder groups uh, that are involved in the project, and I didn't see anything related to disability. Um, there's the Committee for Accessible Transportation, and there's the City County Task Force on Disabilities, both of which I think should be included in the stakeholder group because a number of the things that have been talked about tonight are incredibly harmful or dangerous for disabled people. You know, talk about the traffic circles, which are incredibly dangerous for people who are blind and low vision. Uh, there's been talk of protected bike lanes, which are problematic because paratransit can't pull over uh, in a lot of the areas. And in fact, there have been a couple of protected bike lanes that have been created already that had to be ripped up again because it turned out that paratransit couldn't pull over. Uh, it eliminates uh, parking that a lot of seniors and disabled people need. Uh, there was talk of eliminating a bus route, which, you know, just a reminder to people on the call, there are a lot of people who rely on those bus routes for their everyday transportation. Uh, and I just want to make it clear and just even there wasn't a sign language interpreter on this call, which is shameful. Uh, and I just want to put it out there that you really desperately need someone or someone's on your stakeholder group who are looking out for those issues before they become a lawsuit. Thank you so much for that, Elisa. Yeah, um, I want to uh, acknowledge um, those points that you raised. Um, I do think that, you know, the identifying the subtitles as a, you know, component of these meetings um, is certainly, you know, an oversight on our part. And I think it's something that we can um, look for options for these as we move forward. Um, <laughs> no pun intended. Um, this is the first meeting that we're doing. And so I, I, We'll apologize for that and I hope it's something that we um, correct for future um, engagement efforts. Um, I can't speak to the formation of um, that stakeholder group, unfortunately, um, but I know that we do seek to engage um, the city's ADA coordinator early on in these efforts. And I think if we did miss something or that's that group in that effort, um, you know, thank you for raising that here and, and we can go back and, and reassess. Uh, Just the, the fact that there is an entire committee for accessible transportation, they should absolutely be a part of this moving forward. And we're aware oh, well, of I just want to say too, I have been involved with stakeholder groups and access is represented um, at the Shadyside Ellsworth stakeholder group. Yeah, we are currently looking for a person like for uh, to represent ADA and I would recommend if you think you know somebody uh you know they could totally send us an email with the recommendation as well all right um let's see who we have next we have uh teresa hi uh first thanks for the meeting and uh taking all our questions so my question is regarding the existing beacon route that is between Whiteman and the park. And um, I'm wondering about parking and uh, the impact on that, as well as whether there is still opportunity in the future. I think you said it was still in the design stage, whether there is um, opportunity for input from community members at a future meeting or some other way. Um, because I live in a area that has high, high demand for parking on that section of the route. Um, so. Thank you for that. Uh, yes, thank you. I think all of these projects we know involve a lot of trade-offs. Um, and that's all of these discussions are around trade-offs. So I hope that you'll um, again be involved with as we move to consult and engage um, with the community in these projects as we go into design. Um, but those are certainly things that we're trying to collect data on and understand better so that we can make um, the best decisions around those trade-offs. Thank you for that. And we have 
Daniel. Hi. Um, so I have used the, the new neighborways in Highland Park and Friendship uh, along the Coral and Comrie um, that were just added. And um, just like some concerns with how the cars still tend to drive on these neighborways. And to me, it seems like maybe cars are just being negligent. Um, and there is a lot of signage indicating that you need to slow down. But um, I've noticed a lot of cars that either barely start stop at the stop signs or come very fast turning, um, you know, left or right. Um, and I'm wondering if there is any way to incorporate like at extra signage if we're going to use neighborways in shady side um, in a similar way. Thank you, Daniel, for that feedback. I'm glad you've been riding on the neighborways. Um, I will say that not all of them are complete. Like uh, you mentioned the one through Friendship and Bloomfield. Um, those ones are do not yet have the traffic circles that have been designed and proposed um, and are being installed in the spring. Uh, those should help to calm traffic more and, um, you know, provide some of those sight line improvements. Uh, but I, I totally agree with you that, you know, the neighbor ways are certainly um, a good start and we'd like to, to make them as comfortable as possible. Um, I think that more signage could be an answer that could be also, um, you know, we're going to continue to monitor them to see if we can uh, improve, improve comfort and improve safety. On them, but I hope that you'll continue to give us feedback on the existing neighborways, especially as they do get installed um, and how they might be able to continue to be improved, um, especially now that they are established as, you know, a bike network priority corridor. I just have a quick follow up. Um, the stop signs are still up for Island Park and the Friendship Bloomfield neighborways. How, uh, are they going to be removed um, when there's extra infrastructure added in the spring? In summer? Uh, at this point, we are looking at um, the traffic circles will be installed and the stop signs will remain um, based on uh, feedback that we got from the community um, on safety. So we are currently, that is the, the next phase of design, um, is that there will be both a traffic circle and, and stop signs at those intersections. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, all right, thank you for that. We have a deal. Thanks, Ricardo. Um, I wanted to ask Angela and Paige uh, uh, specifically about the Ellsworth connector, which is where I've been spending most of my time. Um, I wondered about the, uh, I haven't been clear about the question of tr uh, the bus transit and the possibilities of calming options for the street. I mean, most people I talk to feel pretty strongly about reducing car traffic on Ellsworth. But I don't know that, like, I wonder if there were any um, trade-offs we're not aware of in terms of, uh, you know, the buses and then the, the ability to reduce speed on, on Ellsworth in terms of, I don't know, neighborways, speed bumps, et cetera. Is there, is there something we have to, is there a reason why we have to, to make that trade-off? Not for all of the designs that we've been looking at. Uh, I know that transit just has some implications when, you know, you talked about um, reducing motor vehicle traffic. Um, I know that's something that people have brought up um, on Ellsworth a few times. And, you know, when we're looking at anything that would reduce the ability of, you know, any kind of like traffic diversion that could affect the buses. Um, so it's a lot of nuance to that. It's not um, a lot of traffic calming and buses can totally work together um, and find a way to find that balance. It's not necessarily traffic calming and um, transit are not necessarily at odds. It just depends on the context and the solutions we're trying to design around. So if I hear you correctly, there's sort of three different uh, uh, possible uh, avenues there. There's there's keeping the bus or not keeping the bus. There's uh, bike lanes uh, in the parking or not parking. And there's reducing the speed on the road altogether in ways that could happen with, without, with or without both of those other things. But they're not like, there's not like a trade off where you say you can't slow the road unless you get rid of the bus or, or vice versa or something, right? Right, I guess I would certainly say it's definitely not that, um like you're saying it's definitely not that that direct that it's you know keep one remove the others it's just really um just a matter of trying to figure out the best solutions for this exact street and then figuring out how that could affect buses but 
I would say that, yeah, the, the issues around transit are not about should we move transit for the sake of removing transit? We would absolutely not pursue that um, by any means because we want to increase, we want any of our designs to, you know, increase capacity around transit and safety for everybody um, whenever possible. Right. Okay. That's helpful. Thank you. I'd yeah. like, I could just maybe add to that. I, I know there's been um, several questions specific to Ellsworth um, and, you know, there is a sort of separate initiative for that. Um, I just want to offer that, you know, the city in Domi has learned a lot about um, the process of engaging the community and, uh, you know, bringing designs and making sure we're evaluating um, all alternatives and considering potential trade-offs um, and constraints when we're making these types of decisions. And so um, I think that when we do have that conversation about this connection, um, the Shadyside connector, it's not just Ellsworth we're talking about. Um, I think our goal is that we're really bringing um, the full range of alternatives that have all of those trade-offs sort of identified so we can have a constructive conversation about um, the alternatives and uh, that are out there. Um, because I don't think that has happened for this corridor. And um, I think that's been, you know, why there's been uncertainty about it. So um, I think we have an approach this time that we're looking forward to continuing um, when we have that conversation. Thank you for that. And yep, I just wanted, before I go into the next two people, I see that uh, Eric also shared the link for that meeting that's gonna be specifically for Earth for Ellsworth. So please click on that link, sign up to that as well. Uh, so next one we have uh, Sean. Hi there. Uh, I just want to say thanks for having this meeting. I really appreciate you guys taking the time to do this it's late at night. I appreciate it. Um, so my question is maybe a multi-part question, but so I was walking around the uh, Euclid neighbor way and I, I really liked it. And I saw that there are little like feedback things posted um, like for a survey. And I really like that concept because I mean, there are a hundred and some people in this meeting and like that's a small, small majority, uh, minority of the people who live in these areas. So are there plans to do similar things um, for, for all of these projects, I guess? I mean, all of these in particular, because like I know a lot of people who work like late nights at the hospitals and stuff can't come to these. So other forms of engagement beyond the, uh, the like late night meetings, I guess. Will there, are there plans for anything like that? Uh, that's a great question, and, and thanks for being with us. I guess I, I could start just by saying that, yeah, for at least the meeting will be recorded. So if somebody, if they didn't have a chance to look at it right away, they'll be able to look at it through the website. And I, I believe the the service that we create will will be open for for some days, so people will have a chance to to add their input. I don't know if uh, Angie or Paige wanted to add anything else to that. I think to that point, maybe Ricardo, if we could just uh, flip it down to the last slide, um, which has the, um, the website um, link and the Gmail. Um, I think uh, what was brought up was the, you know, making sure that we're using all of this outreach is fantastic if you're, you know, connected in the digital world and, you know, you're on the, the listserv and you've sort of elected to sign up. I think that um, there is a component of this project, which is about, you know, making sure that there are signs in yards and signs posted along the corridor so that, you know, users of those spaces actually have the opportunity to know um, that there's a project and a possibility to weigh in on. So that is something where um, it's new for the city and we're doing it underneath this project because I think we recognize the value that it brings. I think you can expect to see more of um, outreach efforts that are sort of meeting people where they are in the street, um, as opposed to having to give us your email. All right, thank you for that. And we have Eric. Hello, quick question. So on March 11, there's going to be a meeting. I am interested in knowing about what will be the purpose of that meeting and if you guys will be presenting the uh, design drawings for the proposed uh, routes for the Shadyside area. The second question will be around pedestrians. I know that this project will take 
um, a lot of time and capital from the city. I was wondering if there is going to be some kind of focus around pedestrians in general. Thank you. Thank you for that, Eric. Can I take the first part of that page or do you want me to? Yeah, that sounds great. I'll take the second. Um, I think uh, content for that meeting, um, you could expect to uh, have some of those identified um, alternatives, um, maybe not fully fleshed out, but certainly um, we will be looking for reactions to um, several scenarios. Um, and I guess what I'll say about pedestrians is that we hope to bring um, this is, you know, multimodal and we want uh, the great news about a lot of bike infrastructure is that it does improve safety for all road users and that includes motorists and pedestrians. Um, so that's kind of, you know, the onus around the bike plus plan and following that. But I do, we do, of course, take, you know, pedestrian fatalities or crashes, all of those things go into our data and we try to, you know, create a safer experience for pedestrians, um, you know, whenever with these designs. Um, absolutely. Okay, one last question. Um, so once the design phase is complete and the uh, different discussions has been um, complete with the community, what will be the, uh, I mean, who will be making the final decision? What will be driving the decision as to what to the next, as far as construction goes or as far as uh, the final design to implement it will be? Um, that's a great question, and it really is going to vary on the type of facility um, that we identify. Um, you know, there's there's some projects that can be implemented in house, some projects which we might need to go out and seek additional funds or you know a special um, request in the capital budget. Um, all of the projects will be, as I said, delivered um, by the Department of the Mobi Mobility and Infrastructure. So DOMI as the Department of the City that oversees our public rights of way um, is the, the agency, if you will, that uh, will deliver these projects. Um, we do that, you know, through the, you know, the community process we've talked about today, and then, you know, the planning, design and engineering process. Um, and opportunities for engagement um, throughout. Um, Paige, there's just been one more question I think that you'll be able to answer best, which has kind of been an ongoing discussion in a lot of different forms, but could you just clarify about the mini roundabouts in neighbor ways and how their design is different from say, a a uh, larger roundabout and what that means for people who have low vision or other mobility um, issues or ways of getting around. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Anna. Um, this is, uh, these are conversations we've had a lot of in the past summer as we um, pursue this new traffic calming tool. Uh, if you go on Euclid right now, many of you have mentioned you've already seen it. There are um, piloted uh, temporary traffic circles, um, mini neighborhood traffic circles um, there currently the made of flex posts, although the final design would will be a little more robust and more beautiful. Um, we have, they are a traffic calming device. Um, they're very different than like the large roundabouts you'll see that it would normally be like a signalized intersection. Those, you know, especially in like areas like Europe, you'll see these very large <laughs> Um, roundabouts, but what we're talking about is a much smaller tool that fits within an existing four-way stop typically um, to, uh, to calm traffic. And what we've seen is that there's a lot of, there's some, a lot of research um, around them, but it's all, uh, it's a pretty new thing. But what we have seen is that overall, um, it's a huge improvement um, to, you know, speeds get a lot lower, crashes, uh, in Seattle is has thousands of them throughout Seattle. It's one of the big cities that have been exploring them and they've seen, you know, 90% reduction in crashes at some of these intersections. Um, so they are, um, you know, that is their, their primary purpose is to get speeds lower um, and make less points of conflict through, through an intersection. 
Um, we've designed them specifically to have minimal implications to the crosswalks um, to try and kept the stop signs to try and keep um, them as accessible as possible and um, improve conditions for, for all, all users, including um, pedestrians that, that use them. And we've updated the crosswalks at all of those um, as well and um, tried to work uh, to make them you know, as safe as we, since they are something that's new with the city. Um, to make them safer. We've also been using, uh, collecting a lot of data around that. So we've done a lot of video footage that we've collected and analyzed uh, to try and understand, um, understand them better and make them safer for everybody. All right, thank you for that. I see it's 7.30. I feel like we had some good questions. I know there's a lot more questions in the chat. And just another reminder, just to let you know that we'll be answering those questions and we'll send you uh, that FAQ via email. Um, I really wanted to thank, you know, Angela, uh, Anna, and Paige for presenting tonight. And thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, I know that there's also people asking about a survey. I will be sharing a link to that survey after this meeting. I'll send you that via email to the email that you use to register for this meeting. Um, I don't know if there's anything our team wants to add. Just check out the Move Forward website. Thanks for that. Yeah, I'll send you that link. <laughs> and thank you guys. Yes, thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank you so much. Please uh, join us for the next meeting. I'll be sending you that email with all these different links. So hopefully it'll be easier for you to know what's what. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I hope everybody has a great night. Thank you all.